I wanted to kind of go over uh, the process that we talked about for figuring out minor key signatures again. And uh, if you haven't remembered how to do that, if you go to the OneNote and you go to minor keys, there's a little uh, sort of process that you could follow in order to figure out the relative major of a minor key. And by doing so, you figure out the actual key signature for the minor key. So um, anyway, one of the games that I made actually kind of quizzes you on this. To find the relative major of C minor, do you need to go up a minor third or down a minor third? Okay, type up. What is a minor third above C? E flat. The number of accidentals, an accidental type in E flat major. Let's do this as a class, okay? Everyone hold up your hand. We're going to obviously go in the flat direction, okay? So zero flats is C major. One flat is F major. Two flats, B flat major. Three flats is E flat major, right? We're just going, we're basically traversing in fifths, so we figured out that it's three flats. So let's type in three flats right here. What accidentals are in the key of E flat major? So remember, you could figure out the order of flats by using what statement? Bead gum candy fruit. Yes, it sounds. You know, I haven't had breakfast, so that sounds pretty good. So, bead, gum, candy fruit. What that really says? Well, there are seven letters encoded by that statement. B, E, A, D, gum for G, candy for C, fruit for F, right? So, the three flats are B flat, E flat, and A flat. And we got four of four correct. To find the relative major of D sharp minor, do you need to go up a minor third or down a minor third? First question is pretty easy, it's the same, right? What is a minor third above D sharp? F sharp. Right. The number of accidentals and accidental type in F sharp major. So let's try this, okay? Let's go up to circle of fifths, hold up your hand. C, G, D, All right, so I've got six fingers up, right? So I'm going to write six sharps, OK? What accidentals are in the key of F sharp major? So you guys remember the statement? Fluffy cats go down alleys eating bologna. Or there's another statement as well. I can't remember it. But anyway, the sharps are F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, D e sharp, and that's six sharps, right? Let's see if that's correct. Hey, we got four, four correct. Okay, great. So this is all making sense to people, right? I'd just like to actually hear from the class the order of intervals starting from unison, okay? Ready? Go. Unison, minor second, major second. Okay, build a perfect fourth below this note. Well, this is, what note is this? Okay, C. Es verdad. Now, what is the alphabetic class that is a fourth below this letter, which is C? G, right? It'll be some form of G, but let's just actually figure out, looking at a piano, starting on C, every time I go down a note, I want you to say the interval, okay? Minor second. So in this case, it's, the answer is G. You don't have to flat it or sharp it. A perfect fourth below C is indeed G, correct? So we'll put G. Ah, very nice. Build a major second above this note. So this note right here is G, OK? So we're on G. Let's just do this again. Let me, let me make this a little bigger. Ooh, nice. OK, unison. Okay, and that landed on A, so in this case we don't have to flat it or sharp it. It is what you get, right? 
let's advance on to augmented and diminished intervals. So now I'm just going to select diminished and augmented intervals, right? Sharps and flats, whatever. Got it? And, um, okay, so we're supposed to build an augmented fourth below this note, okay? So in order to do that, the way I like to think about it is you have to build an interval that's one bigger than a perfect fourth, okay? So it's helpful to actually figure out what a perfect fourth is first, okay? So what is a perfect fourth below F sharp? Well, let's just figure it out. Unison, minor second, major second. Minor third, major third. Perfect fourth, correct? Perfect for a perfect fourth below F sharp is C sharp, correct? Okay, so if we want to make that interval bigger, what would you, what would the C sharp become? C, right? See if it's correct. Ah, very good. Okay, so we're trying to build an augmented sixth below this A, okay? And um, in this particular case, you want to build an interval that's one bigger, one half step bigger than what interval? A major sixth, right? An augmented sixth is just one bigger than a major sixth. The augmented sixth, or any augmented interval, is one half step bigger than the biggest interval of that numerical class. So like the biggest kind of sixth there is before it gets augmented is a major sixth, right? So let's build a major sixth below A. And a major sixth below A, let's just do this as a class, unison. Okay, so we have the letter C. First of all, we have to make sure that the alphabetic classification matches, right? It's a sixth below A alphabetically has to be some form of C, correct? Now, we have to make this interval a little bit bigger so we get over here, right? And you might say, well, the answer is B. It's not B, right? That, that would be incorrect. That would, that would uh, disagree with the alphabetic classification, which has to be, it has to be some form of C. So in this case, it's actually going to, instead of being C, it would be C flat. C flat. I should have said instead of being B, it would be C flat, right? So it's going to be C flat. I'm going to click C flat. You can all enjoy that answer together. Okay, great. Um, build a diminished third below this note. So let's see. Diminished third, we kind of have to think the other way. Um, diminished intervals, basically you find the smallest interval that exists for a specific interval class. So like a third, that's the interval class. The smallest type of third is a minor third, correct? So to make something diminished, you have to take the smallest interval of that interval class and make it even smaller, okay? It's the opposite problem with the augmented intervals, okay? So what is the smallest type of third? Okay, so let's build a minor third below G, okay? So let's do it, let's all figure it out as a class, unison. Okay, alphabetically, this pitch is E. It matches, it matches the pitch class that it's supposed to be for that interval, right? So we have to make this interval a little smaller, this interval from G to E a little bit smaller. We have to go this way, right? Does that make sense? Because if I had two cursors right here, I could show you that basically we, this is, we're going from G to E, we have to make this interval squish it, we have to make it a little bit smaller. So we have to bring the E to this direction, okay? So the E becomes this note, which is what note? E sharp. E sharp, and it's not F, right? Because we have to maintain the alphabetic class of E, correct? So it becomes E sharp. Ah, we're getting all these right. Okay, great. You know how tedious that process was of figuring out intervals using half steps? It's actually simpler if you know the major scale. I have this note right here, it's A flat, right? And I have this note right here. What I do to figure out this interval is I actually quickly make an A flat major scale. Whoops. Right? So I've made an A, a flat major scale, right? And then I know the intervals of the major scale, right? I know that the first note of a major scale to the second note is what kind of interval? First to third? First to fourth? 
This is a good uh, call and response. First to second? First to third? First to fourth? First to fifth? First to sixth? First to seventh? First to octave? Perfect octave. Yeah, it, it also has a built-in rhyme because every single word, I, second word, I, the last word I say will always be the word that, the last word you say, so it sounds cool. But anyway, to get back to this particular demonstration, compare, so we've decided that the first note to the third note is a major third, right? That's the definition. So if you look at this interval, and in your head you can unpack a major, thir major scale really quickly, you see that this matches the scale, correct? So as a result, you can clearly say that this interval right here is what interval? Major third. Major third. This is great because not, this, this uh, relies a little bit of work, more work up front, but it gives you a more theoretically uh, robust way of thinking about intervals because you're thinking about intervals in the context of a key which encodes more information and uh, it's pretty valuable. So let's think about this one, okay? I'm gonna, let's, let's figure out this interval, okay? So this right here is some sort of fourth, correct? Right? Let's figure out if this fourth actually exists in the key of A flat major. I didn't have to delete those notes, I just realized, but recreate them, not too bad. Right, so let's see. The fourth note of the major scale compared to the first note is what, perf what interval? Perfect fourth. This note doesn't match, does it? Is this interval a little bigger than this interval? Yes, it's a little bigger, which means that it this interval right here is augmented, right? You following along? Anyway, I'm not going to delete this. Let's try this one. Okay, just by quickly looking at our scale, you see that this note right here, this is supposed to be a fifth of some sort, right? The fifth note of the scale has a flat, right? This note doesn't. So let me ask you. Is this interval bigger than the interval found naturally in the scale? Yes, it's bigger, right? Which means that this is an augmented fifth because the interval naturally found in the scale is a perfect fifth, right? Can you understand how this is kind of a cool way of thinking about it? Of course, it's predicated on you knowing your major scales really well, which is precisely why I'm going to quiz you on it right now. So type the notes, or I guess I'll type the notes of an A major scale. What are they? A. Type the notes of an A sharp major scale. So basically, whatever answer we just had, every single note would be sharp. Okay. So let's try it. A sharp. Let's just okay. Let's just let's just type an A major scale. A B C sharp, D sharp, E F sharp, G sharp, A. And let's just add a sharp to every single note. A sharp, B sharp. What happens when you sharp a sharp? Double sharp. So this becomes C X. D D sharp becomes what? D X. E becomes E sharp, F sharp becomes FX, G sharp becomes A sharp becomes A sharp, right? Cool, cool way of doing it, correct? B flat major scale. B flat, C, D. Remember, start whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. You got two of three correctly. What? It's not, it's not, it's, it's torturing me. Oh no! Okay, okay, here it is. What did, we, what did we do wrong? Oh my gosh. Right, that that should have been the case. I just incorrectly typed a major scale to begin with. The fourth note of, a D, of an A major scale is an, the fourth note of an A major scale is D, not D sharp. So we double sharped it for no reason. But it's still, the strategy still makes sense, right? Every, all the other notes are correct. Use this. I really, I'm, I'm telling you, like, you should really know this, like, you know, your multiplication tables. Um, you learned your multiplication tables, and eventually, you don't just memorize them, you just, you know them, right? You can't really explain it. You should know this, like, your multiplication tables, in a similar way, where if I just, if I just ask you a scale, you'll just be like, blah, 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 you'll just produce it, and you'll know it. It's so valuable to be able to know the notes of a scale, because you'll be able to read key signatures better, uh, you'll be able to interpret them better, and you'll also be able to identify intervals faster. 
And you'll just become more fluid at knowing differences between whole steps and half steps. So I encourage you. I made this game for all of you. So anyway, practice. We're going to go on to some other scales now. So we have, C, we have the C major scale, right? If you have the C natural minor scale, you have basically the third scale degree is flat. The sixth scale degree is flat. OK, let's try a different scale, OK? C major scale right here. Instead of just flatting the third, let's just flat the third scale degree. Let's flat the sixth scale degree, but let's leave the seventh one alone. OK? This has its own name. And the name of this scale is called the harmonic minor scale. Okay? And in this particular scale, all you do is you flat the third scale degree and the sixth scale degree. Okay? Let's try a different combination. Let's just create, let's just create another random combination of these, okay? Let's try not flatting the sixth note. And then you get another scale. This one is called the C ascending melodic scale. Okay? Let's try a different one. What's one that we haven't done? We flatted the three and we flatted the six. We flatted the three, the six, and the seven. We've just flatted the three. What's another possibility? Three and seven. And this one right here is called C Dorian minor scale. And this is flat three and flat seven of the parallel major scale. Okay? I like this way of thinking about I like this way of thinking about minor scales because it gives you a context of, of thinking about them in relation to the major scale, which is another reason why it's really important to know the major scale, which is why we prefaced the major scale before we did this. Because this is all contingent on you getting the notes of the major scale correct. If you don't get the notes of the major scale correct, just as you saw earlier when I made a mistake on the game, all the resultant transformations you do and perform will give you an incorrect answer because incorrect from incorrect is still incorrect, right? So make sure you get the major scale correct if you're using this technique. Let's construct an F major scale, shall we? Start, whole, you guys tell me. Oops. The next one is what? Half step, above it. Right, whole step above that. Good, whole step. Whole step, half step, great. Okay, so this right here is F major scale. So what happens if I take the third note, I flat it, I take the sixth note, I flat it, and I take the seventh note, I flat it? What is the name of the scale? Great, okay. Ooh, okay. What happens if I take so now let me, let me go back to an F major scale. What happens if I take the third note of the scale and I take the sixth note of the scale and I flat it? What does this become? F harmonic minor. For, I'm telling you, for the majority of my life, oh yes, please. It's a great question. What happens in a natural minor scale is kind of unique. So let me actually create a melodic minor right now, OK? This is a perfect opportunity to talk about this. So this can be melodic minor, ascending. So what's interesting about melodic minor is that it's different ascending when, than it is descending. So descending, actually, surprisingly, it's descending melodic minor is the same as natural minor. This is descending melodic minor. Um, you'll notice that when it's descending, the 3, 6, and 7 are all flatted. It's the same as F 
natural minor descending. It's a little harder to see on F because you can't clearly, you probably don't know F minor as well. So let me actually do the same thing on C minor, okay? So, okay, so this is ascending C natural minor. Sorry, ascending C melodic minor. Okay, so this right here is C ascending melodic minor. This right here is C descending melodic minor, which is the same thing as natural minor. Okay? Descending the same way and descending the same way. It kind of sounds major going down, but by playing it natural minor going down, it sounds sad going down. So it's ultimately because the six and seven are not flatted on the ascending melodic minor scale. It sounds major going down if you don't flat those scale degrees. And since those are the first notes that you hear when you're going down, it's, uh, it just kind of makes it sound more minor. That's why you play it differently going up and down. Versus... It almost sounds major for a little while, right? So that's, that's the reason. Okay? So anyway... Um, I won't belabor this too much because it's really pretty easy once you know the major scales, correct? It's just a matter of flatting and sharpening and just memorizing the definitions, okay? This will be like one of your homework assignments. I'm just going to quickly show you the difference between Do-based minor and La-based minor, okay? So if I use the chromatic syllables for Do, You notice that there's some, some symbols that you're not familiar with, right? You, you would expect me here, but instead you see me. You would expect la here, but instead you see le. You would expect t here, but instead you see te. Notice how the vowels for flats are all a, right? Okay? That's one advantage of using la-based minor instead of using do-based minor, because when you use do-based minor, you actually have to use chromatic solfege, and you have to flat certain syllables, correct? This is kind of easier to see by looking at this, right? These are equivalent sounding things. If you use this solfege, you use this solfege, it doesn't matter, but this, arguably, the law-based minor is a little easier to read and process because you don't have to use chromatic solfege. So that's why when you have pieces in minor, or exercises in minor, and recite singing them, which we will do, and you guys will be here for, because I have the extended sheet. Um, it's simple, often, to use law-based minor. But with that being said, you're eventually going to you're gonna have to get to a point where even in law-based minor, <laughs> you're going to have to introduce chromatic solfege, and for this reason alone. What happens in natural minor if I naturalize this law? The law becomes sharp, sharpened, right? So in that particular case, I actually have to use chromatic solfege. I have to make fa, fi, I have to make so, si, right? La, ti, do, re, mi, fi, si, la, instead of la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, right? Okay? So there was, it was inevitable we got to this point. Chromatic solfege, I actually love chromatic solfege. Yes? How much would be sharper than the other That's a great question. Great, great, great question. Um, those are sharps that rarely ever happen. So we don't actually have to worry about it. I've made up my own syllables because I'm a solfege nerd and I love solfege so much. I'll say it with you guys. Do, re, me, fa, so, le, te, do. Okay? So fa, so good. Okay? We're in the key of F major, correct? So the starting note will be what? Me, okay? Ready? Go, let's find an F. Uh, this has a dotted rhythm as well, so that's kind of exciting. Ready? Go. 
Mi, re, do, mi, sol, la, sol. Mi, fa, mi, re, do. Let's do the next one. This exercise is in C major. Do. No, this, I mean, so we'll make it do. Ready? Two, three, go. Do, two. That wasn't just so-so, guys. That was really good. All right. Let's try the next one. Um, what key are we in right here? Let's figure it out. G major, D major, A major, E major. E major, OK? So E, so this is another, you know, key signatures make things easier to read once you figure them out. But you have to figure them out. So right here, we're starting on me, right? Do, ready, go. Whoops. But the starting note isn't do, it's me, do, me. Ready, two, three, go. Let's do the last two measures. Me, let's see if I... Uh, Mi, mi, re, ti, do, two, three, go. Mi, mi, re, ti, do. OK, excellent. Ah, these are difficult key signatures. Let's calculate it. F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. OK, so D flat. And what notice this, guys? D flat. Correct? So this is going to be Do. Do, two, three, go. Do, mi, so, do. Let's do that again. Ready? Go. Do, mi, so, mi, do, so, la, so, fa, mi, mi. Do, ti, do, re, mi, re, mi, fa, so, so, to. That Honestly, that was a little so-so, guys. That one was so-so. Let's do that one more time. Ready? Go. What note is this? I mean, let's go for me. Let's, let's just do some hand signs, okay? <laughs> Ready? 